Today is September 13, 2021, and my guest is journalist and author Rowan Jacobson. He has written books on apples, oysters, and now his latest book, and our subject for today is Truffle Hound, On the Trail of the World's Most Seductive Scent with Dreamers, Schemers, and Some Extraordinary Dogs. Rowan, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks, Russ. Good to be here. So your your book is the story of the world of truffles. And I've heard of truffles, but I actually didn't know much about them. I now am fully educated, remarkably so, by, by your very entertaining book. But I think most of us, when we think of truffles, think of chocolate. So but that's not what your book's about. So tell us what truffles are. You know, it, it's funny. Most people actually think of the chocolate truffles uh, when they hear the word truffles. But the chocolate ones are named for the real truffles, which are the fruiting bodies of a fungus that lives underground and has a partnership with trees. When the fungus wants to reproduce, it makes these spore-filled balls, which are called truffles, and which the chocolate ones were kind of inspired by. So that's crazy uh, because the real ones, the ones that are fungus, um, aren't very chocolatey most of the time, <laughs> it's, it's from what I can tell from your book. But you're saying it's just the shape the round little ball thing? Yeah, basically when the first chocolate truffle came along, somebody took, looked at this little round ball and thought, what does this remind me of? Oh, I know, the, this thing that, you know, a mushroom that lives underground that's really expensive. So that's a good thing to name these after. So uh, they are really expensive and maybe we'll get into why that is as from an economist perspective, but Give us a feel first for how expensive they are and, and a little bit about the world of truffles. There, there are a whole bunch of different varieties. Some are more expensive than others. Some are more considered more tasty than others. Um, give us a little bit of an overview. Yeah, so the, the two famous truffles are the black winter truffle, which is associated with France, and the white truffle, which is mostly associated with Italy. And um, the white goes for about $3,000 a pound in the U.S., and the black goes for maybe 800 a pound. And the difference in those prices is um, not a, a perceived difference in quality, but because the black truffle uh, is cultivated. We figured out how to farm the black truffle. The white truffle, no one's ever been able to figure out how to farm it, so it's purely a wild foraged ingredient. So um, supply is much uh, sketchier for the white. So the wild forage, foraged ingredient, as I love that phrase, because uh, most of the book, a lot of it's a cultural commentary on food and, and life and, and dogs and being outside, which is really cool. But a lot of it's just the challenge. They're underground. You, you can't mostly, almost always, you can't see them. So how the heck do you find them? And that to me was one of the key fascinations that led me to, to work on this book is here's this very significant industry that can only find uh, its uh, material by using a dog. The, um, <laughs> truffles smell really strong. That's their whole reproduction strategy is they're underground, but they smell so strong and irresistible to an animal that an animal with a good schnoz will be able to detect them from yards away and will be consumed with the need to dig them up and eat them and then spread the spores later. Um, we are not one of those animals with schnozzes that good. So we need a, a partner. And originally people partnered with pigs a few hundred years ago. And, you know, a lot of people think we still use pigs to find truffles, but back in the 1700s, people figured out that it was a lot easier to work with a dog than a pig. The dog doesn't actually care about eating the truffle. It just wants the treat. So it will dig up the truffle for you and then look for its treat. So no pigs have been used in a long time. Pigs like the truffles. They eat them. That's one of the reasons that they got um, – they're unemployed as truffle hunters because, right? Yeah, they love them, um, and they are unemployed, except for Nicolas Cage's new movie, Pig, where um, – you know, <laughs> which centers around him having a truffle pig that gets stolen, and he has to go find his truffle pig, but – uh, no one told the, the the screenwriters that no one uses pigs anymore, apparently. Okay. Based on a true story, kind of, once, <laughs> 300 yeah. years ago. Um, the um, There is an expression, even a blind pig finds a truffle every once in a while, right? Which is a <laughs> fascinating expression to me. But I had heard that, and I didn't 
your book allowed me to actually understand uh, the, the richness of, of that line. Um, and of course, the blindness is not so important. It's, <laughs> that's really say, interesting. I never thought about that. No problem for a blind pig. Yeah. Yeah. So the dogs, you said people don't have good enough schnozzes. Uh, there's a nice discursive treatment of human smell versus uh, dog smell. I always, you know, quote, they have a more sensitive nose. It's a little more complicated than that. Explain why uh, dogs are so much better at smelling a truffle. Remember, this thing is underground. It's exuding some kind of scent uh, and producing volatiles, the, the, the little pieces of stuff that go in the air that make the scent. Uh, why is a dog so much better at sensing that than a human? Yeah, and it is amazing how much better they are. You know, it can be like 35 degrees in a cold Italian forest in December, and a dog will be finding these things from 30 yards away when they're a foot underground. It's just amazing. Uh, and pinpointing the exact spot and telling you where to dig. And it's because the dogs have several different kinds of upgrades on, on our noses. Um, <laughs> one, they just have a lot more uh, olfactory receptors. So if you think about it like a camera, they've got, um, you know, they're going to have a lot more sensors um, picking up on that image. So you're going to have a much higher pixel image, much higher resolution image. Um, and then the, you know, the size of the schnoz, they can actually bring in a lot more air uh, at a time. So they're sampling constantly. And they have a unique um, physiological evolution that allows them to be better than us too. You know, for us, we have basically one passage that we breathe in and then the same air goes out through the same way. So it's in, out. And so everything's getting mixed up and we're breathing in some air that we just exhaled. For dogs, it doesn't work that way. They've got those little slits on the sides of their nose and that makes it a constant one-way uh, stream. So they breathe in, the air actually gets held up in their um, their nasal passages for a, a while and then shot out through the sides of their slits. They kind of have a, a little flap where they can change the direction the air goes. So then they're always breathing in fresh air straight up and in. They have time to analyze it and then they shoot it out the sides. So it's a whole different system. And in the actual hunt, they're trying to, uh, of course, there's unlike, a, say, a beam of light where you can just you see its source and you can head toward it. Smells are constantly, scents or con aromas are constantly wafting around in different directions, making it a little harder to pinpoint where it's coming from. And what the dog does is this really beautiful dance of triangulation and often with the second dog, correct? Yeah, they'll, a lot of hunters will have uh, two dogs and sometimes even a third trainee dog who's just, whose job is just to watch what the other dogs are doing and learn. Um, but yeah, they'll, um, they'll bracket a smell. Um, and then just like you say, they'll start triangulating. You'll see them just like going back and forth in the woods and you see dogs do this with other smells all the time. And what they're doing is they're building a mental spatial image in their minds of where that scent is. And then they, so that they can go right to it. And presumably they're measuring something about its intensity, which is, you know, it's a hotter, warmer, colder thing that's telling them to where to head in which direction. And um, yeah, there's a lot of dog life in this, um, in this book. And I, I, Rowan, I told you before we started, I'm not a dog person. Uh, I, I'm sure a lot of listeners now are pausing their video, their audio or their video and saying, oh, <laughs> Econ Talk was nice, but it's over. Uh, but I'm not particularly a dog person, but I, I've, it's interesting. I've, I've, I've come, come to appreciate dogs partly through YouTube. Uh, because I've seen more dog-human interaction through vid shared videos than I did when I was not a dog person, particularly not a dog person. But one of the things that's really beautiful about the book is this um, the zeal with which some dogs uh, interact with their both owners and the truffles in this search. And talk about the different breeds and how much they cost because it's rather extraordinary. It is, yeah. Um, so a good, a good truffle dog can – as we said, a white truffle can sell for $3,000 a pound. So if, if you have a dog that's capable of finding a pound of truffles in a, in a day, that's a very valuable dog. So 
you know, I've heard a lot of different prices, but there's a there's a breed um, from Italy called the Legoto Romagnolo, which is the only breed that's actually specifically bred for truffle hunting and has been used for truffle hunting for hundreds of years. And they're pricey now. Like they go for, you know, $5,000 is, is pretty typical. Uh, if you get them from uh, Blackberry Farms, which is this um, sort of high-end resort in Tennessee that's become famous for breeding them, I think there it's more like eight or nine thousand dollars, and you've got a three or four year waiting list. So the dogs are expensive, mm-hmm. um, but a really good truffle dog, if you're a professional, will pay off. So it's worth it, and you know one that's trained and and is good to go because it takes a long time to get them up to speed if they haven't been doing it. But one thing we learned across the cars, the, what's fun about your book is it starts off with this very romantic image of Italy as the source of all the great truffles and the legato Romagnolo dogs as the as the only really true truffle dogs. But as the book evolves, we learn that there's there's truffles in England, which is one of the least romantic places you could find truffles, perhaps. Uh, there's truffles in Canada. There's truffles in Oregon. There's truffles in North Carolina. There's truffles in Serbia. And people use all kinds of dogs. And some of them even don't like the legatos. I did not – I had never heard of the breed. Uh, you can Google it, folks, at home. It's uh, it's maybe the cutest dog I've ever seen. So I can see <laughs> the appeal of them. They're really perfect if you're going to romanticize Italian truffles and have a dog called Legato Romagnolo. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah. it's we got the word Rome in it. It's perfect. So, but there are other breeds, right? Yeah, you know, um, and I think you, you nailed it. Like the Legato just has the perfect image. Um, and they are, they're really cute. They're, they're the um, ancestors of the modern standard poodle. So if you like poodles, you're going to love Legotos. It's like a poodle with a much better name. And um, they're super enthusiastic about it, high energy. They look like they're smiling all the time. So super appealing. I can see why people go crazy for them. And they do go to Instagram, plug in Legoto, and you will see how crazy people are for their Legotos, whether they hunt truffles or not. Um, but all the professional hunters I went with said, you know, any, any like mutt off the street can learn to do this. If you know, you, you work with them. Now, again, not being a dog person and not doing that much work with the TSA uh, and <laughs> dogs at the airport. I never really thought about how you train a dog to look for one smell. I understand that you could train a dog to do something, but one Smell. That's all. Like the worst thing in the world would be a, a travel dog that wanders off in search of squirrel, uh, which is less than three thousand dollars a pound usually in my supermarket. Uh, how do you train a, a truffle dog? And you know, even the best travel dogs do still have the squirrel issue. Like <laughs> this will be a dog that's worked for years. It's on the job looking for truffles. Smells a squirrel, and you know, <laughs> you got to wait ten minutes because you know <laughs> squirrels still rate higher than. Than the truffle, but um, yeah. So they're di- and they're kind of different um, philosophies. There's sort of a European philosophy of dog training, which is much more strict, and um, you know, it's like a working relationship. And then there's the American philosophy of truffle training, which is make truffles, make hunting truffles the most fun thing you could possibly do, and just make your dog want to do it all the time. And they both seem to work. Um, but in Europe, like the dogs are often kenneled; they don't live in the house; they're working dogs. So you'll, they'll get their dogs out and go on the hunt. And for the dog, it's, you know, it's their exercise. It's the most fun thing they do because they're in a kennel. Um, so they're super into it, but um, it's like, it's work. And they like being working dogs, just like a border collie likes being a working dog. Um, America, we're much softer. It's like we're softer when we train our kids, you know, in school and we're softer with our truffle dogs. So in America, you let them start eating the truffles when they're young. You you hide the truffle under pillows in the house and they find the truffle and then they get a treat. Um, you just make them love truffle hunting so much that that's all they want to do. And then you go out in the woods and they've already learned to look for that scent because you've been burying truffles for them. And then hopefully they start learning to find the wild ones. And that's always the the tough part. Like it's easy to train them to find a truffle in the house or under a pillow <laughs> or even like <laughs> that you've just put under the grass, like one inch under the grass. But transitioning to a wild setting is always a lot more complicated because there's a million smells out there in the woods. 
And it's like the difference between batting practice and real game. You know, it's, yeah, it's those, those yeah. artificial things. Uh, I'm going to read a short excerpt. Um, what I'm, there, there are many parts uh, that amuse me in your book. Um, it's very colorful and entertaining. But this part I really liked. Um, you're working with um, uh, a um, two dogs, uh, an owner of a dog named Istvan and Mocha. You say Istvan is also the pope of truffle dogs. And the owner says, I can train a dog to find truffles in 30 minutes. Just throw a truffle in the grass and let your dog fetch it over and over. Be very happy when they bring it back. Then start burying it and do the same thing. You continue. The harder thing, he says, is finding a dog who loves to work hard day in and day out. So many hunters told me their dogs were toast after two or three hours. But Isfan and Mocha hunt six hours a day, five days a week. And then your um, your truffle expert gives his advice for, for the ideal truffle dog. Which I just love this. One, buy a year-old dog. Its personality will already be evident. Two, hunting and retrieving breeds are best. Water retrievers can be really good. He's not a fan of legatos. Too much energy. Three, don't get a dog that's too smart for its own good. They have to like doing the same thing over and over and over. Four, train your dog alone, not with an older dog. When dogs are together, they pay attention to each other, not you. The mind meld happens when you spend a lot of time alone with your dog. And then this amazing story, Istvan, one of these truffle dogs, was once hunting, hunting in Italy with friends. The first truffle they dug up had a hibernating frog next to it. Everyone exclaimed over the frog. The dog was watching their reactions closely. After that, it raced through the woods, digging up frogs. And it's, those are dogs. You know, you can't really, it's hard to explain stuff to them. You got to get it right the first time, I guess. Yeah, I love that story. I and mean, that guy, uh, Istvan Vaghi, was... Uh probably the best truffle hunter I went out with that was in Hungary and, and his dog Mocha, he and he and Mocha had really did have a mind meld or they'd worked together for years. Mocha's a black lab, very like mellow, um, which was a totally different approach than the Lagotos I, I was with. And yeah, they could, ju- they would decide ahead of time whether they were hunting black truffles or white truffles that day. And <laughs> they just had all these hand signals between them. It was really quite amazing. Uh, I, I confused readers. I think I assumed Isfan was one of the dogs. He's the owner. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry. When you said he was the Pope of truffle dogs, I thought maybe he was within the truffle dog hierarchy. The Pope. But no, he was, <laughs> he's the – okay, I got it. Um, one of the extraordinary things about truffling, truffle hunting, is uh, it's become something of a tourist attraction. And there's this um, romance. Again, as we read your book, we find out there's a wide range of – different types of people who hunt truffles, but in this sort of romantic, seductive version, uh, it's a, you know, a, a down, a, a salt of the earth peasant like person with a dog. And, and you can go out with them and, and, and experience the, the magic of truffle hunting. And as you point out, a lot of these folks bury truffles in advance so that the tourists will be sure to find something and have a good day. Um, and so talk about how you didn't want to do that and what <laughs> some of your days were like when you insisted that they not be buried in advance and you actually could, as a journalist, not just as a tourist, find out what the experience was like. And tell us what that experience is actually like, what it's like <laughs> to go out in the woods on that cold December day in Italy. When you go to Alba for the International Truffle Fair uh, in Italy, which is the giant one, you'll see lots of uh, – you know, advertisements for, you know, people who want to take you out on a truffle hunt. And they don't really say that it's a simulated truffle hunt. But of course it is because um, tourists, you know, tourists are looking for quick bang for the buck. They want to watch the dog for half an hour, an hour at the most. They want, they want some success, right? They want uh, the instant gratification. Um, so from that perspective, it makes sense to do a simulated hunt. And the, the hunters, sure as hell, aren't going to take a bunch of tourists to their best truffle hunting spots. <laughs> I mean, they don't take anybody to those spots. So <laughs> it's simulated. But for whatever reason, they don't, they don't tell you that. It doesn't, they should just say, you know, we buried these in advance. Now let's have fun watching the dog do its thing. But they don't. They try to pretend it's real. Um, but I, of course, being a journalist, wanted the full the full deal, you know, like in, being from the uh, the Hunter S. Thompson School of Gonzo Journalism. I wanted the whole experience. So I finally found a hunter who was willing to like 
really take me out. But yeah, what that meant is they they all go in the night, in the middle of the night in Italy. And it's um, and when you ask why they do all this hunting at night, you get a bunch of different answers. Like, you know, there's a, the romantic answer, which is, you know, it's it's all mysterious. Nobody can see what you're doing. It's secretive. Or they'll say, you know, the wind is less at night and the temperatures are cooler. It's easier for the dogs to detect the scent. But then you ask a few more questions and it turns out like, well, they started hunting at night because they all have day jobs, right? So <laughs> like, when are you going to hunt? Um, this was the only time available. Um, but they still like the tradition is to go at night. So there you are at midnight. It's cold because the truffles are ripe in November and December. And uh, you're just like, trying to keep up with the dogs in these forests where you can't see. Um, and you're also worried that you're going to be found by another hunter or possibly whoever's land you happen to be like on because there are some public forests and there are some private forests, but it's hard to tell at night sometimes. So it's, um, and it can take four hours and you often get skunked. My first time going out, we didn't find a single truffle for a full night's night's hunt. Um, <laughs> And that wasn't the only time I got skunked. So there, there's a very romantic idea that, you know, you just sort of like trundle after your dog for a little while and you come home with your truffles. But it's actually a lot of work to uh, to find the truffles. It reminded me a lot of my youth when I was spent a lot of time fishing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's easy to claim that if you don't catch anything, it's just as good because the real point's to be outside. And But the truth is you want to catch something. And the other part that reminded me of fishing is that just like under the surface of the water, you never know what's lurking, how big a fish. The fun thing about truffle hunting, they don't all come out the size of um, chocolate truffles. A lot of them are bigger, smaller. So talk about some of the, the excitement. And, and by the way, and talk about how you actually have to excavate the truffle once the dog finds it. It's not it's not so straightforward and you had some misadventures. I was going to say adventures. You had some misadventures. <laughs> yeah. The, um, so the, depending on the type of truffle, they can grow from a couple of inches under the surface to a foot or more down. And the Italian whites, the really valuable ones, tend to grow the deepest. There, there'll be a foot down often. And also that soil in, in central and northern Italy is pretty rocky. So it's it's a, you know, it's a workout to actually get the truffle. So they all carry what, what's called a vanghetto, which is kind of like a little spear with a, or, or a trowel with a long handle, maybe like a three foot handle. And once the dog finds the spot, you know, the dog will start to dig and then they'll push the dog away because they don't want the dog's claws to hurt the truffle because the pricing on truffles, uh, you know, there's different tiers depending on the quality and a, a dog nicked truffle is immediately, you know, you're down to like tier three or whatever. So they'll, they'll once the dog finds the spot, they'll push the dog away and start to work with their Van Ghetto. But you don't want to nick, nick the truffle with that either. So it's very much like excavating like valuable dinosaur bones. I did that once for a story and it was the same thing. You sort of go down in a wide uh, circle around where you think the truffle is, especially if you think it's a, a good one. And then slowly dig around it until the truffle is basically on a little pedestal of, of soil with a, a big uh, like bomb crater around it. And only then do you slide underneath and pop it off. So it can be, it could easily be, you know, 20, 25 minutes of work to get a really good truffle. And like you said, you don't know ahead of time how big it's going to be. And often, you know, you'll have the full excitement of a find and you dig down and you get a little BB that's like <laughs> has no value at all. And, and, you know, you can still smell it. The smell's still there. It's amazing, but you can't do anything with it. The aesthetics of the truffle itself, when you say if it's nicked by the dog's paws, it's, you know, it's not worth as much. Some of these truffles are going to be taken into rest high end restaurants and shaved at the table over pasta, say, or other food, and the experience is, is more, more aesthetically pleasing if it's a whole undamaged um, truffle, correct? Yeah, and that, those are the ones that are really expensive. The, all the chefs want a, a beautiful round, basically a golf ball. That's what they're looking for, that they can get these perfect disc 
slices of over pasta or eggs or whatever. So if, if it's got furrows in it, if it's not round, um, it, it's not worth as much. Um, and sometimes the truffle will be broken when you dig it up or the digger will break it. Like I, w once I thought I knew what I was doing, I volunteered myself to dig up a truffle and I, I destroyed it, um, with, with the, the Van Ghetto and turned, I don't know, a, uh, uh, $500 truffle into a hundred dollars worth of pieces of truffles. And, uh, I didn't try to dig up anymore after that one, but, uh, but so, yeah, so the pieces get sold to use in sauces and stuff, but for the table side, you really want something that's as aesthetically pleasing as it is sensorially pleasing. My favorite part of that story is when you dug up your own one is that when you cracked it and butchered it and ruined it, the dog averted its eyes in shame and embarrassment for you. Um, at high-end restaurants, I... Uh, like most of us have, have been in a restaurant where someone might, I don't know, crack some pepper, you know, and they're cracking pepper and you go and they say, is that enough? And you say, oh, keep going, do some more. Or you might have Parmesan cheese at the table. Sometimes if you're at a low end place, it's a shaker, but at a nicer place, it's a nice, it's a piece of cheese with a little, uh, you know, a uh, grater. And that's not the way they do with truffles, is it? Yeah. Well, you know, at that price, and this is really a European thing that Americans have picked up on a little bit. But at that price, you know, you want to know exactly what you're getting. And then they want to charge you for exactly what you're getting. So it's this this bizarre ritual where they come to the table with the truffle and the shaver and a little scale, like like a cocaine scale, basically. And they weigh the truffle and then they start grading and they keep grading until you you're, you say, like, you know, basta and then they weigh the truffle again and so you've paid the difference uh in price between what it used to weigh and what it weighs now so you can get as much as you want um but uh it's gonna run you you know four euros a gram or whatever so like if you were really into if you really love truffles and you really wanted a lot over your pasta like you tell a story in there about a a serving of eggs, which might be 10 euros with the truffles on it, it's 40, which is something on the order of $50 worth of eggs for breakfast. It's a very expensive breakfast, even by modern metropolitan standards. Uh, is that kind of what you're adding to the cost of your food when that scales at the table? Is it a $20, $30 addition to spice up your pasta, or is it sometimes more than that? That's that's it's just sort of like the entry level is yeah you're probably adding about thirty bucks, um, but you, and it can go up from there. Um, so that sounds it sounds a little crazy, but sometimes I like to compare it to the bottle of wine at the table. Like people don't hesitate to spend a hundred bucks on a bottle of wine for four people, um, right? So it's it's kind of like might, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, whether they should hesitate is another question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's not uncommon for a bottle of wine in a nice restaurant to cost a hundred bucks or even more. So I kind of see them as uh, another, like bringing another expensive bottle of wine into the into the evening. Now, one of the charms of your book is the emotional response that truffles engender in you as a newcomer to this world, or something of a newcomer. Um, you say at one point that they don't have much taste. It's the smell that's the – that the, the smell is the powerful thing. Um, you have a whole bunch of really wonderful uh, attempts by people to uh, describe it, what it smells like. Um, you write at one point – this is your, your own version. I've smelled lots of yumminess before, but this was different. It was the warm, cozy scent of chocolate chip cookies baking, nor was it mouthwatering. It was hardly a food scent at all. It was more like – Catching a glimpse of a satyr prancing across the dining room floor while playing its flute and flashing its hindquarters at you. You think, what the hell was that? And then you think, I have to know. So there are many beautiful – here's one of, the, one of the nice ones. There are many beautiful evocations of the scent, uh, gasoline, garlic, uh, strange pineapple. I, it's hard to describe, so people have tried. But it's seductive. It, it gets into your bones somehow, evidently, and you want to pursue it. Um, is that what happened to you? Totally. I, I was seduced by that first truffle in, in Italy. 
and it is it's it's very difficult to to describe there's there's so many different volatile aromas that truffles make and clearly they figured out like what drives an animal crazy but it's surprising like one of one of the the, the immediate responses you have when you smell that first truffle is i'm fascinated i'm fixated um i want more but you can't quite understand why because it's not a standard deliciousness type smell it's more it's something that just sort of takes over your mind which I think is, you know, the truffle's goal all along. <laughs> You're right. You quote Josh Ozersky, a food writer, who said he described it as, quote, a combination of newly plowed soil, fall rain, burrowing earthworms, and the pungent memory of lost youth and old love affairs. Um, it's really a it's inspirational fungus. I mean, there aren't many fun- fungi that manage to tr- bring out that kind of poetry in writers. It reminds me a little bit of scotch. Uh, yeah, you know, people yeah. – um, one of my favorite – there was a contest for people to describe what Laphroaig tastes like. <laughs> and um, a lot of people don't like Laphroaig. It's one of my favorites. It's in my top three uh, Scotch favorites um, with Ardbeg and Lagavulin. But the winning entry or one of the winning entries in the, in the Laphroaig contest was that it's like kissing a mermaid after she's eaten barbecue. <laughs> It's That's a really awesome. gorgeous piece of poetry, right? To describe yeah. something, it's indescribable. It's smoky. Okay, it reminds you of the ocean somehow. So you get the mermaid. It's just really, it's really cool. But how is it that yeah. if the main thing is the scent, how does it get used in pasta? Are you smelling it while you're eating it, or is it somehow it does have a, a strong taste in some set once it's been shaved, or what, what's going on there? Yeah, and this is one of the very strange things about the whole culture of truffles to me is when you first smell them, like when when the thing comes to your table, say, or when you first like find it in the ground and like there's just this amazing sort of complicated emotional (laughs) sensation of, of when it hits you and sort of like goes straight into your like your emotional circuits in your brain, but then it can very quickly, this thing that was intense and overwhelming can easily disappear and it's so volatile. And so it gets, once it gets put on food, especially if the food's hot, those volatiles can disappear pretty quickly. Um, So it can go from overwhelming to invisible, like impossible to find. It's very elusive that way. And people screw up truffles all the time. Chefs screw it up all the time. A lot of chefs really don't have less experience working with them than they might let on. So they actually try to like cook with the truffle and then you just lose it. You, you really need to use it at the end or, or just before the end of, of cooking or with the whites, they always do them at the table raw for that reason. Um, but it's just, um, it's, it's for something that's very expensive. It can totally disappear on you. So if it's done wrong, people can be very underwhelmed by their truffle experience. And now we come to a great, sad for some of us, um, disillusionment that that you came to, which is truffle oil is not really truffle oil. Talk about that issue and how um, chemical and synthetic truffling truffle flavor gets used. Yeah, and that that's the solution, the industry solution to the fact that these things are tricky uh, to work with. At some point, I don't know, in the uh, 70s or 80s, I think originally, chemists figured out how to synthesize one of the key uh, components of, tr- of truffle smell, uh, a, a chemical called dithiopentane. And it does, if you smell it, you're like, oh yeah, that's part of that truffle thing. Um, but it's only, it's only one of 50 or a hundred different molecules that are in the real truffle smell, but it is one of the dominant ones. So it's got kind of like the, um, you know, the old socks scent of truffle. Um, <laughs> but it, I, uh, I think I would have picked a different one, but okay. <laughs> that's what they chose. All right. Jim, one, you know, uh, gymnasium, uh, <laughs> it's, it's like, it's a, designing yeah. a perfume called gymnasium. Hmm, or locker room. You wouldn't think that would sell, but that's what they did. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and and unlike the real truffles, it persists in food no problem. Plus, you can use it's super cheap. You know, pennies per application, so you can use as much as you want. So this whole new wave we've seen of truffle products 
the truffle salts and truffle oils and truffle fries. That's all truffle oil. Um, and, and it's so totally synthetic. There's no truffle in there. But it does give people a very strong experience. Not necessarily a great experience, I think. But um, I think it actually turns a lot of people off of truffle who've never had the real thing. But it also makes people expect to be completely overwhelmed when they do have truffle. So the subtleties are, are completely lost. The part I liked about the synthetic truffle oil thing is that uh, you talked about some of the chefs who had been using it extensively, and then they find out it's, quote, fake. Now, you could argue, well, it's just a chemical, and troubles, real troubles have chemicals, and so it's not that bad a thing. But as you point out, it's not really even beginning to capture the real thing. And it's the fun part is that they kind of should have known that it wasn't the real thing because it was cheap. So as an economist, I just love that. You know, you think you're getting this great bargain. You're getting truffles themselves or, or you know, 50 bucks to add to your pasta. But I just sprinkle some oil on for a nickel. That's probably not going to be the same thing. Yeah, and the economics of it are really interesting. Um, you know, and you can, I'm sure you can think of a, a hundred parallels, but does introducing this super cheap ersatz version uh, make undercut the real thing or make the real thing more valuable, you know? It's like yeah, diamonds and, sure. and fake jewels. Yeah, yeah. It's fascinating. The other economics, there's a lot of economics sprinkled throughout the book, uh, but one of the things I loved the most was, um, I'd already met, I've already mentioned that for me, the truffle hunting experience reminded me of fishing. You can actually compare it at one point to lobstering. You say, take a wild resource and enough time and the locals will work it out no government required. What were you referring to there? What's the um, the informal norms that prevent the tragedy of the commons and, and preserve the uh, the hunting or the fishing and this, whatever you want to call it, and we, the truffling that, 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 that happens as a result of those norms? Yeah. So w but with lobstering, it's pretty, pretty well known that basically the, the fishermen have worked it out amongst themselves over generations where everyone knows where everyone's spot is. And even though it's theoretically a commons, they figured out how to prevent the tragedy of the commons. Um, and so if you come into an area and fish someone else's area, you're going to find your lines cut on your boat or worse, you know, like you're going to find some people waiting for you when you get back to the docks. It's not going to happen. Like and they, they, um, you know, they police their resource very carefully and, and, you know, like your spot will, when you're done, will be inherited by someone else, but it's all unofficial yet. It's very real. Truffling is the same way. And I think it's for the same reason because it's done sort of in places that are out of control of the state. So the state's never had to like come in and, and make the rules in, with truffling. You're out in the woods. No one really knows what you're doing. No one's um, policing you officially. And then you come in with this and you're selling this, um, you know, this small, untrackable, valuable resource into a completely gray market, basically, where there are buyers who move it up the chain, but they're pretty much avoiding the, the tax man all the way uh, traditionally. So it was always um, so the rules had to just evolve naturally. And they did. So just like with lobstering. If you have an area that you've inherited or you've earned for some reason that you can go truffling or you and your family can go truffling in Italy, it's often families. You've got that and everyone knows not to go there. There are also some public areas where everyone can go. But if you if you try to go somewhere else, um, you know, there's like lots of stories of people coming back to their car in the middle of the night and all the tires have been slashed. Or, or worse, uh, sometimes in Italy, dogs have been poisoned. Like if somebody is hunting with their dogs in an area that they don't have unofficial rights to, people will actually put out poison baits for the dogs. Like I've never talked to anyone who experienced that directly, but there's definitely a lot of stories about that happening. And then Serbia has become a hotbed for white truffles and, and farther into Eastern Europe, Romania. And everyone told me that things get um, you know, tougher, the, the farther East you go, the tougher things get. And that, uh, they, they said they would not feel comfortable just like hunting blindly over there. Talk about the culture. Generally, a lot of the people you talked about, you spent a lot of time 
with different types of people in this business. Some are doing it kind of on the sides. Others are doing it full time. Some of them, their families done it for for generations. It's a really fascinating look at yeah. You know, fishing and other other activities are like this. There's a, a huge range of how much intensity is is devoted to it. And of course, when it's incredibly valuable, a little bit like a gold rush, there are a bunch of people start saying, "I'm going to go spend the, a couple of days just to see if I can turn up one." Um, talk about that culture. And the kind of people it attracts, um, and and what it was like to be an outsider in that world. So yeah, like like fishing, um, nobody wants to show you their best spots, uh, so you have to kind of talk them into it. Uh, and but in this case, the people who are really good at it, they kind of want to show off a little bit at the same time. So you know, um, they want someone to see how good at it they are or uh, the dynamic here was really interesting because even a bunch of guys it's mostly guys um who would never they, they don't need you to know how good they are like they would rather just keep it quiet um, and not reveal their spots but they love their dogs and they really want you to see how good their dogs are they're like so oh, proud so of their cool. dogs <laughs> so, so the dog was the key thing that I think got me into a lot of places where I, you know, once they knew I wanted to chronicle their dog's genius, they're like, all right, fine, come on, you have to see this. <laughs> um, so that got me into a lot of places. But yeah, it's, well, it's often, it's, as you'd expect, the, the people who want to be off with their dogs in the woods, like it's an excuse to take a walk with your dog in the woods, maybe get away from the home for a little while. And uh, if all goes well, you've paid for the trip and then some, right? And at worst, you've had a nice walk in the woods. So there's that aspect to it. Then there are um, sort of like, and in certain areas, this is more true than others, but the guys who um, might not have a real job and, you know, might need to like score a hundred bucks today for various reasons and uh, are just out prospecting. Um, and they don't necessarily last that long at it, but there is, uh, there's the occasional sort of like a crackhead truffle hunter, as well as the, the traditional guys who make it a profession and have done it for years. You talk about uh, the British truffle person who leads a very intense life. He, he's supplying some of the best chefs in in England with truffles and um, spent a lot of time on a motorcycle uh, delivering them and, or finding them at the last minute. Talk, talk about that and what that was like being with him. This is a guy named Zach Frost, who's kind of transformed the truffle business in, in England. Um, because for a long time, truffles were like, or one, so many other ingredients in the restaurant industry where, you know, these guys would just show up on, on your back door at, with products and you would buy them. And you didn't really know much. It was kind of before the whole like farm to table revolution where the chefs weren't that interested in uh, the providence of these ingredients but then that changed, um, you know, and for so many ingredients and truffles because they were traditionally dealt by these old school French and Italian companies didn't change with the rest of the farm to table movement. But now these, there's new guys coming into the industry who are doing exactly that. And Zach Frost is one of those. So he wants the chef to know exactly where all these truffles are coming from. He wants them to know about the hunters and the dogs it wants to make it much more personal and also improve the freshness. Like there's much less of a chain of supply there. He works directly with hunters, gets the truffles, hops on his bike the day they arrive and starts delivering to chefs. So that's really changed things. Uh, and there's a few other guys like him, both in the U S and, and in Europe. Uh, but yeah, so what that means is that he's ordering these ingredients that cost thousands of dollars a pound and that deteriorate within days. So it's to me, it's like the nightmare of anxiety where you you might be shelling out 50 grand for a shipment that is going to be worth nothing in eight days. So, and, and you know, and the clock is ticking <laughs> because truffles are constantly losing weight because they're losing moisture and they'll rot after eight or 10 days. So he's basically got to be on that bike and has got to get all those truffles delivered as fast as he can. So that's, uh, yeah, that's his life. And you talked about the provenance of the truffle and first part of the book, you are a little bit um, seduced by this as well. 
that the Italian travel, the French travel, uh, somehow a Serbian travel doesn't sound as as exciting, but that and a lot of truffles that are passed off as um, Italian or French are actually coming from Serbia or Spain, or even in the case you, one case you chronicled, China. Uh, so talk about that that Chinese debacle for uh, one of the larger producers of truffles in Italy. Yeah, the, the French and Italians kind of set themselves up for disaster by pushing this uh, this myth that the best black truffles came from France and the best white truffles came from Italy, uh, which was fine until they ha- had to until there wasn't that much of a supply in France and Italy of those truffles, so they had to be getting their truffles from other places, which were just as good all along. Um, but they couldn't, they, they were stuck with their myth at that point. So they just keep pretending. So Spain grows most of the black truffles, sells them to France where they get sold as French truffles for the pure, the single reason that supposedly French truffles are better, even though they're the same, same deal in Italy with the white truffle, more and more are coming from Eastern Europe or from central Italy, um, and are just as good as the Alba truffles that were originally made famous but the Italians are still stuck with this story they have to tell about how all truffles come from Alba and those are the good ones. Um, so they just need, they need to get rid of these old myths and um, celebrate the fact that truffles come from all these different places and might have small differences depending on the place and, and the landscape. Um, but that's actually part of the fun. So I think, I think we're, we're seeing this revolution taking place in truffles, kind of like what we saw in the wine world a generation ago where people started realizing like, oh, there, there are wines from places other than Burgundy and Bordeaux, and they're pretty good too. So let's learn about all that. But the China thing was oh, a yeah. special case. To talk about that. So the, 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 ultimate, uh, the ultimate example of getting trapped by your own story was the, uh, the, great, the, the great black truffle, the black winter truffle. Uh, is considered the creme de la creme of of all the the black truffles. That's the one that goes for about eight hundred dollars a pound, but it's always in short supply. There's a truffle that grows wild in China that is a dead ringer for it, but has like maybe like two percent of the smell. Doesn't really smells like nothing, but it looks just right. So for a while, um, ten years ago, twenty years ago there was this huge surge of truffles being dug in China, shipped to Italy or France, and then sold as black winter truffles, French black winter truffles or Italian black winter truffles. Uh, but they were all Chinese. It was illegal. And the numbers were huge. One, one de- uh, dealer in Italy was caught with 47 tons of these Chinese truffles in their warehouse um, like 10 years back. So it was um, probably a significant amount of the black truffles being sold in the world were completely fake and were actually these Chinese truffles. And that's, I don't think that's true anymore, but there was a dark but era that, there. That, that 47 tons, I think you said in, it, that the, Itali- the entire Italian crop was 30 tons, <laughs> yeah, something like the, that. Yeah, yeah so the French, was- <laughs> Italians produce maybe 20 to 30 tons a year each. And so it was, this was a huge amount of, of ersatz truffles. So is there an explosion of – at the very – toward the end of the book, you talk about some of the attempts to farm truffles. I'm living in Israel, so I – just for fun, Googled Israel truffles and found out some Israeli agricultural yeah. whizzes are trying to create us. You know, I don't know which kind. I don't remember, but they're, they're growing truffles in some novel way. There are a lot of people in America creating – basically, you create a tree farm and – you you seed the trees with truffles so that when they as they mature the truffles expand and, and fill up the, the the soil beneath the the surface of the of where the trees are. Um, this must be ha- it, given the prices. This must be happening in lots of places, and I assume it's going to have a little bit of a long run effect on bringing that price down a little bit. Is that happening? Do we see that? Yeah, well, you tell me because that's that's um, you're right. They're the French truffle. They've gotten pretty good at cultivating it, and people are doing it all over the world. I actually met that Israeli guy at a conference a couple of years ago. He he was on it, and uh, I think you're going to see some really good black winter truffles coming out of Israel. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> but, but yeah, like 
And it's funny because you see the people, the, the truffle promoters, like pulling, encouraging new people to plant their farms. And, you know, you see like the, the, the returns on investment. And the assumption is always that the price is never going to drop. But, um, you know, Economics 101, I would assume once yeah. everyone's neighbor is growing black truffles, that uh, supply is, is going to uh, affect things. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I'm thinking. But, but your point, which is a, a sub-theme of the book, um, is that there is this European brand, whether it's the French or the Italian, that – you know, in, in the case of wine, you can't call your product champagne if it doesn't come from the region of France. You know, so you call it Prosecco or whatever other names there are for sparkling sparkling wines. You can't really do that with, with truffles, or at least they haven't figured out. They may try to do that. But especially if it's true that it turns out they are just as good. And and so one of the the themes of your book, which you just alluded to a minute ago, is what I might call the de democratization of truffles, that there's this glamour about, say, champagne, and then it turns out, you know, Prosecco is pretty good. Uh, and so there might be this glamour about Italian and French truffles, which could keep the price somewhat insulated from um, – competitors and new new arrivals, although as, as the, if they're being sold in the gray market as French and Italian, it's not going to help them. They're going to get – they're going to have trouble keeping that price up no matter what. But I, I love this idea that this very stodgy um, – no, stodgy is not the right word – traditional, traditional way of doing things is being disrupted. It's being disrupted by technological innovation and in, in, – the farming of truffles, this, this agricultural innovation we were just talking about, and it's being disrupted, I assume, by chefs all over the world wanting to bring this product to their customers and realizing that they can't all have Italian. And they, the pasta is still pretty good when it's not the Italian, it's a Serbian uh, truffle. So talk about what's happened with other products like wine and how that process has worked there and why you think it's we're in the middle of that with truffles. Yeah. Um, and with truffles, it's being disrupted uh, like by the technological innovations of growing the trees um, so people can grow them all over the place. But it's also the, being disrupted by cell phones because um, what you're seeing now, many of the hunters I went out with, they've got their uh, clients on their cell phones. Some just individuals, you know, buying them for their home dinners, some de dealers, like small scale dealers, where they find truffles, they'll just, uh, you know, call the first person on the list and say, you know, take a photo of the truffle and say, you want it? Uh, I'll put it in the mail to you tonight. So um, their cell phones have allowed some of these hunters to cut out that whole, all the middlemen in the chain go straight to chefs or straight to consumers. And I think that is really going to democratize the truffle business. But yeah, back to um, sort of like the hierarchy it seems like the French really love to create hierarchies for everything. Yeah, like true. this is the best version of this. And here's the third Wine, best version. cheese. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, for a while truffles were sort of prisoner of that. And that's really changing now. Um, you know, the sort of Americans want to try all of the examples of something and, and, um, and they see what's good about each one. And so with wine, you know, American wine, the prices are actually pretty competitive with French wine now. And oysters are one thing I've noticed where, again, you had this, um, this uh, inherited conventional wisdom that the French oysters were the best. And then everyone in America started farming oysters and people started noticing that they were like the quality was amazing. And now with oysters, there's been a real shift where people don't really think the French oysters are better anymore. So it can happen as soon as um, it always takes some time. They're, they're like the the perceptions can hold something down for a while, but eventually, you know, the chefs are gonna figure it out. Especially younger chefs. I think it's often you, you get generational turnover, and that's when it happens. Yeah, just like in science, right? You have to kill yeah. off the people with the wrong theories before they, <laughs> they get adopted, and the new people come along a little more open minded, don't have the stake in it. Um, I don't think I've ever had a truffle. Um, so give some advice to – for fun, I, I, I Googled um, truffle and, and 
restaurants near me or something. I did Jerusalem restaurant and, and found some truffle fries, which I immediately recoiled in horror from because I now know that they're not really truffle fries. They're Ursat's pseudo faux truffle fries. But say I wanted to, a consumer listening to this, a foodie who's never had truffle, um, one of the things you do gather from your book is it's a bit of a hit or miss proposition that not all the chefs know how to use them well. So you could go to a, a, maybe even a high-end restaurant, spend a reasonably large amount of money and not really get a truffle. So what advice do you have for for people who, you know, I, this, this, this episode reminds me a little bit of the, the Jack Daniels distillery tour in Lynchburg, which uh, I've been on a couple of times. I, I think it's still true, but when I was on the first, the first time I went to that distillery, you know, you see the bourbon and and smell the bourbon in all of its manifestations from its beginnings in a mash form to, you know, it concentrated. And, and, you, and, it, and you, when you're at, when you're done, you really want a Jack Daniels and you can't have one. It's a dry county. Uh, Lynchburg's in a dry county. Uh, right, and yeah. um, they give you lemonade at the end of the tour. At least they used to. Um, so at the end of, my, of your book, I'm thinking – Boy, I'd really like to try some of this pasta with truffles. How, how do you find the real thing? And of course, you catalog the first half of the book is a lot of your um, sometimes disastrous attempts to <laughs> buy a truffle in a back alley from somebody. And anyway, it's it's a very charming and, and amusing uh, set of stories. But if you're a customer and you're you're trying to find a good meal with truffle in it because you've you've listened to this and you think this sounds good, I want to try this. It's a novel experience I've missed out on in life. What do you do? Yeah, and well, one thing that you have in your favor as a customer is that working with truffles is actually really easy. Um, as, as we were talking about, you don't really want to cook with them. So you don't have to figure out a recipe. All you really need to do is shave this thing over your risotto or your pasta or whatever at the last minute. So anybody can do that at home. And so I really think um, home consumption of truffles is is the way to go. And because they're also, you know, they're very small, so they ship great. So it's great to order them online and just have them overnighted to your door and then you're good to go and you're going to be saving money for over a restaurant anyway. But you do have to have the right kind of shaver and you yours got confiscated, your, your first attempt. I assume you have a better one now, but it, you did talk about what happened to you with, the, with your microplaner. Yeah. Well, so yeah, I got that confiscated at the Milan airport. Stupid. I should have known, but like, like I, you can't really like fight your way into the cockpit with a truffle shaver, but uh, I guess, you know, it's metal. It looks sharp. So it's sharp, I lost yeah. mine. <laughs> but, but those are, those are, the funny thing is um, like, you know, you get like, those are when you want those perfect uh, thin slices of thin discs. Uh, but if, in terms of flavor, just any microplane, you know, grater is going to work great. So you can use any grater in your house to do it, really. But the microplanes are perfect. So I, 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 I'm not worried about the, uh, you know, seeing those perfect discs. I just want to get that flavor all over. So I just grate truffles. Yeah, and then, but then you got to look back at the at the grater and realize there's like twelve dollars worth of <laughs> truffle left in the little little it's interstices true. of the shaving part. <laughs> yeah, no, no joke, actually. Yeah. So you spent two years, I think, on this odyssey, and it's an odyssey. You go from <laughs> Italy to Oregon. It's a, it's a, it's a really uh, a mix of, of a food book, a travel log, and a dog book, I'd say, plus um, some nice references to popular culture. Um, the Damn Yankees was a real bonus for me. I appreciated that. Um, <laughs> readers will have to discover why that that's in there, that's, but um, – I'm curious. We're, we're dating ourselves, but I know. Well, I was, but I didn't <laughs> think you were. You're, I'm old. I think I'm older than you. And I'm pretty sure I'm older than you. And I didn't know anybody as as young as you knew Damn Yankees and <laughs> uh, the song Whatever Lola Wants and knew it was Gwen Verdon. I th I think right. my parents saw Gwen Verdon on Broadway in in Damn Yankees. It's um. There's a lot of things good about that show. One of which is the title. But anyway, I'm a Red Sox fan. But anyway, uh, yeah. um, me too. What I'm curious about is. I'd like you to reflect on the impact on you of this experience. I mean, you had a good time. You got a fabulous book out of it. You 
got to the bottom of of a mystery of of you know cuisine and and chefs and and the supply chain and it's all fantastic but the book starts with you being again seduced by this smell and thinking i want more of that where do you stand now are you over it are you still uh infatuated where where's your um where's your passion right now tell us about what what happened to you as a, as an eater uh, and yeah, you confess at the end of the book that you you did teach your dog with some truffle oil to maybe go out and find some <laughs> yeah, he's pretty good. Although he doesn't want to go too far. He like if if there are truffles within three hundred yards of the house, he's good with that. But <laughs> <laughs> beyond that, he's like, eh. um, but yeah, I, that's a great question, and uh, it I, it did change me, and for the better. I I I, I pay better attention to smell than I used to. I think, um, like you know, you would think as a food writer, I would be, have been paying attention to smell anyway, and I probably was indirectly, but just to navigating the world by smell. You watch a dog do it, that you're thinking about smell much more consciously than normal when you're out there truffle hunting. Uh, and you realize how sort of uh, vision centric you are all the time. And that's, that can be limiting in some ways. So I've, I've definitely become a better appreciator of smell and just smell the intrinsic value of smells. Like when you watch the dogs at work sampling things, you can just tell that they're just, it's like we admire art. They're just like taking it in. It's not necessarily goal oriented all the time. I mean, it is if you're digging truffle, but they're just taking in smells because the world is an amazing place, you know, and they're enjoying it. So I've definitely picked up on some of that. And I see forests differently now. The and truffles kind of drew me into a much better understanding of what's going on under the soil than I had before. So I used to think of a forest as just a bunch of individual trees uh, competing with each other for for like resources. Now I know that the the fungi that make truffles are actually connecting all those trees underground in these mycorrhizal networks that are, are interplaying together. So the forest, it, all those trees, even trees of different species, are actually operating more like a superorganism in a sense. And the, the fungi underneath are the ones pulling the strings and trading resources in this sort of marketplace that's happening underground. Um, so I actually see them as bringing sort of like executive function to the forest. Like they're like strengthening this tree, weakening this tree, making, making sure there's a couple other species of trees in the mix. Uh, and for their own ends, but it really is this incredible trading network that's going on under the soil and is, in a sense, able to make better decisions than the trees left on their own wood. So um, I see a lot of complexity in the forest that I might not have picked up on before, and that's been a pleasure. How about as an eater, though? I want to know whether you like truffles. Like, you know, you I, People have obsessions. I would say this is kind of an obsession, if I'm <laughs> personal for a minute. Um, and you get over them, or they become a lifelong habit, a hobby. Is this something you're just going to – is the book over and now truffling is – not just truffling, but the truffle itself is just now in the past for you? Or do you think this is, is going to be a passion for a while? Yeah, no, I'm definitely obsessed. Like, full disclosure, on Friday, I'm heading down to the Appalachian Mountains, an undisclosed location in the Appalachian Mountains for to hunt the Appalachian truffle, the, a native truffle of the eastern U.S. Uh, so I, I'd say the obsession continues. And it's because of the, whatever that the those truffle scents do to your limbic system. You know, they, they cut straight to that area where memory and emotion are sort of entangled. Um, and that's, that's probably changed me as an eater in that I, I sort of realized that that's a key part of eating. It's not just like the flavor on your tongue. It's the way the experience lingers. Like often what will happen with a truffle is you'll have a truffle and you'll be like, wow, that's an amazing smell. But then days later, something will happen to trigger almost like a flashback memory of that smell. Like you'll like re-experience it and you get a sort of a very nostalgic, almost like Proustian moment of being just, you know, like staggered by the memory. 
And it's made me realize that that is such an important part of eating. It's why often, you know, we're drawn to foods from childhood and things like that. It's sort of, um, it's like the story you tell yourself of, of experience. And so much of that is through smell and we don't even realize it. Yeah, the movie Ratatouille is is certainly a tribute to that Absolutely, experience. Yeah. And, and the rats treat garbage the way you talk about truffles. They, they can... <laughs> And dogs, at least, they, you know, they, they savor this particular rotting piece of food. But it's a beautiful, it's a very clever, obviously, way to get at this piece of the human experience that I think we often either ignore or don't appreciate. And I think the idea that it's a weird thing that you can remember a smell, right? You can close your eyes and remember of something you saw from a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, your childhood. You can also close your nostrils and remember what, I remember what my grandparents' attic smelled like when I used to go up there on a hot summer day in Memphis, Tennessee, when they didn't have the fan on. And um, that it's it's a part of life that I think we, that is underappreciated. Yeah, you know, there's this um, this great quote by this uh, scent researcher that I, I use as an epigraph at the beginning of the book, um, which is, Tell me why you love her and what the attic smelled like. Mm. And I, I think that kind of captures the um, that like that ineffable um, profundity of smells. That is, it's hard to find words to explain why they matter so much. Uh, and certainly, like the crazy things people do for truffles, either to find them or to try to grow them. It makes no sense uh, if you just look at the the dollars. Um, so something else is going on. It's a drive that goes much deeper uh, and it's connected to love in some sense, I think. My guest today has been Rowan Jacobson. His book is Truffle Hound. Rowan, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks. This is great. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.